Please receive grace today to walk in wisdom in the name of Jesus. The best gift you can give to yourself and your unborn children is to marry the right kind of person. When you choose a husband, you are not only choosing a husband for yourself, you are choosing a father for your children. When you choose a wife, you are not only choosing a wife for yourself, you are choosing a mother for your children. The secret to a successful marriage is who you even marry. Are you here, somebody? If you get a wrong job, you can resign and get another job. If you buy a bad car, you can sell it and buy another car. If you rent a wrong house, when your rent expires, you can move to a better house. When you marry a wrong spouse, you have been sentenced to life imprisonment without possibility of parole. <laughs> Is somebody getting what I'm saying? We have seen too many people die before their time. Because of the stress caused by wrong spouse. So please, it seems all of us are going the same direction today. Marry well. Marry what? Well. How should, you see, love is, is this foundation for a relationship. Love is what? The foundation for a relationship. And the Bible is clear, it said love never fails. When you hear us make statements like love is not enough, what we are talking about, or if you heard me before, I say things like, don't marry who you love, but love who you marry. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Don't marry who you love, but love who you marry. When we say statements like that, there are two kinds of love we are focusing on. There is love the feeling, and there is love the commitment. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Listen carefully, this will help you. There's love the feeling and there's love the commitment. Many people think that marriage and life is built on love the feeling. No, it is not. That's why when people ask me, uh, can I be in love with two women? Or can I be in love with two men? You cannot be in love with two people. You can be attracted to two people. You can have feelings for even 13 people. But that is not love. Love by its nature is committed. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Love is committed. When you say you love someone, I have a popular message titled, You Choose Who You Love. Because young people think, ah, you know they choose who you love now. Nah? Anywhere where your heart goes, you just go. All those things, are, we, got, we get it from musical videos and from movies. It's not true. You choose who you love. Love is a commitment, not a feeling. Love is that you are committed to a person. You can't be in two houses at the same time. Somebody get what I'm saying? You can't sleep in two houses. So if you are somewhere, then you are there. It's a commitment. You can't be committed to two people. You can have feelings for 13 people. But if you call it love, it is a commitment you make. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? And that commitment must be based on certain things, which is not feelings. I'll mention a few random ones. Number one, this love we're talking about has to be mutual. It has to be what? I can't hear you. It has to be what? It has to be mutual. This means that one person's love cannot sustain a marriage. I love him. Thank you. Does he love you? I love pastor. Ah, I love this girl. Thank you for your love. <laughs> Does she do what? Love you. Marriage is such a long journey. You can't be the one motivating somebody to go with you. They too must want to go with you. Because the time we come on that journey, everybody needs to motivate themselves to keep going. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Love must be mutual. Yes, you love that boy. Thank you. Does he love you? Is the question. That's why I have this book here, remember? How to know if he or she loves you. This is, we're, not, we're, not, I'm not, we're not doing this book to sell books. That's not what I do for a living. It's because there's knowledge here I can't share, finish sharing one day. Today, Pastor, today alone, I got two, two messages of Two different men that walked out of their house. Just carry their bag and disappear. 
See now they are still a wall. They are still looking for them. No coming with children. They left children. And I, I try to teach women all the time. Men and women are different. The way women see children is not the way men see children. Women love children. Men see children as responsibility, as bills. That's what we are seeing. Receipt, invoice. That's what we are seeing. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. So yes, you love the man. Okay, does he love you? You love the woman. Does she love you? Love must be mutual. And by this love again, I will say it again. I'm not talking about the feelings you have for him. I'm talking about the commitment both of you have to each other. It's a commitment. It's not a feeling. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? It is a what? Commitment is not a feeling. I want some people to come on stage. I want to use them as, maybe I'll use from here. Yes, come. You have volunteered yourself. You don't even know what I want to do. You're a good man. What's your name? Toby? Okay, Toby, stand here. I want one more person. Then I want a lady. You're wearing green. Come, I like green. You don't want, you don't want to come. You don't even know what I'm calling you for. You've already said no. Are you married? You should be volunteering for anything. You're not married. <laughs> You don't even know what I want to call you for. You have already said no. <laughs> Praise God. Give yourself some space. So, whenever you hear the word love, those of you that know Hebrew and Greek, there are three different types. All right, please stay in the middle. So, let's imagine this guy's name is Eromosele. Let's imagine that's his name. All right? If you want to shorten his name and give him a nickname, what's one of the options we have? Eros. <laughs> Stay here. So Eromosele's nickname is what? Eros. This lady, what's your real name? Okay, I won't tell the audience. For this example, her name is Philomena. What's her nickname? Philo. Philo. Thank you. Philo Stay. Then this one. His name is Agape. What would be his nickname? <laughs> eh? I'm not hearing it. So I need to know what you're saying. Haggy. <laughs> They've scattered your name. <laughs> All right. So, when it comes to the thing called love, biblically, Hebrew and Greek, there are, are about four, but I'm going to major on three. The first one is called Eros. This is sexual attraction or attraction. This is what most people call love. This is where most people, when they say love, this is what they are talking about mostly. In musical videos, in movies, and all that, this is who they are talking about, Eros. That's the Hebrew word, Eros. It's talking about just passion. This is the one keeping the world going. God put this one here so that this world will keep going. This is the one that makes people marry during war. This one that says, but you know, before I would. This one is the one making children are being born every second, every minute in this life. Because this one, no matter who you are, you need, you'll be attracted to a male, or if you're a woman, you'll be attracted to a man. If you're a man, you're attracted to a woman. This one is natural. Once you throw young people into a room, the men will naturally be attracted to the women, the women will naturally be attracted to the men. This one keeps the world going. It's nature's way of keeping the world going. Without this one, the population would drop. So this one is responsible for all of you here. This is the guy. He's very powerful. He's very compelling. This guy is very compelling. He will force you. He will push you. He will kick you. So you must master the art eh, of resisting this guy enough to check if Philomena is present. Who is Philio? Filio is friendship kind of love. Many people just meet somebody for this one and they say, I'm in love. And they marry. The sad thing about this one, as he's compelling, he does gra gra. How many of you have friends that do gra gra? That they do their power. Is, but when the real issue starts, you understand? It's like what this, all the countries did with Ukraine. And Russia. Russia was saying, we are coming. They were telling Ukraine, stand your ground. Nothing to happen. We're there here. 
They have been beating them for days now. Nobody show. That's this guy. They can make mouth. When the real chips are down, you won't find him. The same way he's shouting, he can disappear overnight. Eros. This one confusing young children all over the world. This one that makes 16 year old say he's in love. He doesn't know what love means. He's just sexually or emotionally attracted to the opposite sex. If you feel this thing for anybody, and as a human being, you will feel it. In fact, the anointing about Eros, Eros, come forward, so that I won't be walking by far. <laughs> the anointing about Eros is that even when you're already married, you will still have Eros for other people. This Eros is very annoying. Even when you are married, JJ, facing your wife or your husband, you will still have attraction to other people. This is why you can't allow Eros to control you. You can't. A Ross is real, but it must never control. If it controls you, your life will be... You, you marry a fool, like Pastor Edwin said. Because he's handsome. You like his muscle. She's beautiful. I like her shape. I just like the way she talks. There's a way she just laughs. <laughs> when she laughs, there's a way it just melts my heart. That's a Ross. Oh. That's a Ross. Don't marry a Ross. A Ross is good, but you can't do any determination based on a Ross. Detain and control a rust enough to be sure. Philomena is present. You see how reluctant Philomena was? It's because Philomena doesn't come easily. A lot of factors, yes. A lot of factors determine when Philomena comes. Philomena is talking about filio. It's talking about friendship or brotherly love. It means we must have so much in common for Philomena to develop. You can't develop Philomena for a random person. There are many people you will have a rust for. By the time you talk to them, and a rust, this is why we tell people, don't meet and marry under 10 days, under 20 days. Allow some time. If you allow some time, a rust doesn't have stamina. He shouts, but after one month, two months, three months, he will calm down. Then you will find out if we have what? Friendship. This one lasts in marriage. Friendship, we can talk. You are my friend. We have a lot in common. We think alike. Our goals are alike. I enjoy talking to you. Outside of touching you, I can talk to you. That's Philio, Philomena. Move back. And when these two are present, you must look out for this last guy. This is the chief commitment officer. This guy... Because in a marriage, there are times this one will go on suspension or travel. There are times this one will be annoying you. When those ones happen, this one is what sustains the marriage. They are all called love in English. But in, in Greek, they are called eros, phileo, and agape. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Now, how do I manage the three? Like I said, when you feel attraction, and you will always feel attraction, you enter a church, you see a fine girl. You enter a church, you see a fine boy. It might be singing, it might be ushering. That's not love. It's okay to be attracted. That's normal, but that's not love. Don't call it love. It's okay to be attracted. Stay, talk to the person, and see if we can develop friendship. Marry your friend. Are you getting what I'm saying? Don't just look for a spouse and try to make them your friend. It's better to look amongst your friend and try to make one your spouse. Anybody that will make it as your friend will make it as your spouse. Are you here, somebody? Again, I have on that book out there titled, Who Should I Marry? I broke the ten C's down. One of the, ten, one of the C's is companionship. Marry your friend. What do, you people, you know, what, what do single people think married people do in marriage? Many single people think, the married people are enjoying. They are just having sex morning, afternoon, night. <laughs> I'm telling you as a counselor, there are married people that even have sex once in a month. Some don't have sex once in a week. I'm telling you, some is once in two weeks, once in one month, some even once in three months. One, I think one of the highest I've met is once in two years. I shouted too like that. <laughs> are you here, somebody? A Ross will make noise. Before marriage. That's why you, this is part of why the Bible says you should not fornicate 
When you start fornicating before marriage, you are exercising eros. No, no, the eros is, ir is, is irresponsible. He won't be there all through. Eros comes and goes. If you start fornicating with someone, you will think this eros will be with me throughout the journey. He will never leave me. He will be, eros will leave. He will always come and go. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. Fornication will blind you with eros. You'll be thinking, I love this person. You don't love them yet until you can check for Philo. Before marriage, for Philo to develop, you have to quiet down eros. If you start fornicating before time, you'll be blind. You're looking at the girl's bum. You're looking at the man's chest. You won't see road well. Marry your friend. Companionship. How many hours are in one day? I can't hear you. How many hours are in one day? People in the gallery are not even talking. How many hours are in one day? Thank you. If you have sex for one hour, it doesn't happen, no. But let's imagine you have, because <laughs> fornication and marital sex are very different. Fornication is stolen water. It just looks like it's sweet. By the time it's your own. It's a different ball. I'm telling you now. I'm just helping you. Fornication and marriage, they are different. Fornic and, and there are so many reasons why fornication is bad. I don't even have time to go into it. See, if you are fornicating now as a couple, the appetite you are building is for stolen waters. The day they give you that is now your own, you'll find out that your sexual appetite for that person will drastically drop. Because the excitement of hiding and stealing it was what was sustaining the sex life. Did somebody get what I'm saying? I'm a counselor. These are the real things going on inside marriage. Many people that go for honeymoon, the honey has finished. Before they reach the honeymoon. Because they've slept with each other so much. You have built the appetite of stealing it. That when they, see, when they now say, yeah, on your mark said, go. She's now your wife or husband. You find out that his interest or her interest is still in that stolen one. And the only way to fulfill that is to now start a side relationship. That will give back that stolen feeling. This is breaking many homes. You can't, there's no free disobedience. Every time you disobey God, you will pay. Every time you disobey God, you will pay. Sooner or later, you will pay. Because there's no instruction in scripture that is for the benefit of God. Not one. There's nothing in your Bible that benefits God. Not one. Everything in the Bible is user's manual. It's how you will use your life. Once you, it's like you buy Apple phone. They say don't put it in water and you put it in water. It won't pain the owner of Apple. There's only one person that will suffer that consequence. It's you. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. Every instruction in scripture is for your benefit. None benefits God. So when you start fornicating, there are too many things to lose. Too many things to lose. Too many. Stolen waters. I've said it, I think I said it sometime this week, somewhere. How many of you have been frying plantain before? And you are stealing the one as you are frying it, you are, as the, <laughs> you are taking commission. Has it happened to a business? Eh? I want to see your hand. I've been frying plantain before, you were taking commission as you were frying it. Good. And as you fry every set, you eat two or three. Because that, see, that one you are eating when they are frying is very sweet. Do you agree? Even the Bible agrees. The Bible says stolen waters are sweet. The Bible agrees that that one eh, is very sweet. By the time they serve the food and all these other people on the table are eating it for the first time, they are all enjoying your, their food. Guess who? The only person not enjoying the food on the table. Because you're already full before you came there. That's what happens to fornication and marital sex. You've already had so much fornication. There's nothing to look forward to in the marriage. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So, marry your friend. Companionship. Philomena, please still come. Marry your friend. We have 24 hours in a day. If you have sex for one hour, how many hours are left? Then, you are a spiritual bro and sis. So, you study the Bible and pray together for one hour. How many hours left now? What will you do for 22 hours? If you are not friends. What we do in marriage is friendship. This is why it's important to build this one. This is why. Can you sit with the person you want to marry for two hours and not touch each other? And just talk. If you can't achieve it, then you're already building a disaster. 
Is somebody getting what I'm saying? This is why many men marry and they, are, they still have a best friend outside their family. Because they're just, they just marrying a, a, a baby-making machine. They don't plan to be talking to this woman. You are supposed to marry your best friend. This person is going to be your confidant for life. Somebody you can share anything with. This is why many women marry and they still have a major friend. When you marry, really, your husband or wife should be your best friend. That's the best way it should be. Companionship. Because as life gets older, you will get busier. You won't have time to maintain another serious friendship. Your husband or wife should be what? Your friend. I don't know if somebody's getting what I'm saying. You build filio. Then lastly, when those two are there, you check agape. Do they have agape? So I'll, I'll round up by talking about agape and come back here. So, how do I know there's agape? Is built on the person's spiritual capacity. There are three aspects to every human being. Every human being is made up of spirit, soul, and body. Every human being. There are three components in you. You see this all over the Bible. I'm sure you, the church you attended would have taught you this. It's basic. Every human being is made up of three parts, spirit, soul, and body. It's in First Thessalonians 5. He said, I pray that your whole spirit, soul, and body will preserve. So we are three parts, spirit, soul, and body. Your spirit is what we call our spiritual life. It is from that spirit that agape flows. Is somebody following what I'm saying? This is why you cannot marry an unbeliever because he doesn't have the Holy Spirit. His spiritual life is not awakened. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? This is why you can't marry an unbeliever. See, when the pressures of life come, it's our spiritual life that determines what we do. The two people I heard today, oh, I, hear, I hear it all the time, but at least I received two today that walked away. It was the pressures of life. One came from abroad, came to Nigeria, married for a few years, but business was not moving in Nigeria. Pressures of life. So he went back to the country he came from, and they didn't hear from him again. Pressures of life. When the, now that I love you, I love you, I miss you, I miss you. When pressures of life come, it is the person's spiritual foundation that determines what they will do. Are you getting what I'm saying? If he's an alcoholic now, say, I just drink every Sunday. Is that the level of Christianity you want? Is that the level of spiritual atmosphere you want in your house? My children have never seen alcohol. Before they even saw Coke, they tried. Honorary Coke. We didn't bring them up on those things. Some of you in your house, there's alcohol, like trophy, in the cupboard. And somebody will say, but pastor, the Bible did not say you should not drink. The Bible did not also say you should not take cocaine. I'm waiting for you. <laughs> there's no way the Bible says you should not drink. There's no way the Bible says you should not take cocaine. But when you're a believer, there are certain things you don't even want to be associated with. There's no way the Bible says you not do betting. There are so many things the Bible does not say you should not do because they expect that if you are full of the Holy Spirit, you can't be high on two things at the same time. Are you getting what I'm saying? You can't be high on two things at the same time. The same of being drunk with wine, be, which is excess, be filled with, because they are the same thing. That's why they call alcohol spirits. They are the same thing. Why are you high on two spirits? If you are full of one, you want another one. Have you seen somebody that has drank 30 bottles, cartons of beer, still looking for gin? If you are already full, you are full. I don't know if you are getting what I'm saying. I know somebody's angry, but it doesn't matter. I came all the way from Lagos to talk, so you can't drive me with your strong face. Are you getting what I'm saying, somebody? When the pressures of life come, he will go to the bottle. He might not start as an alcoholic, but when the pressures of life come, he will, he will double his dosage. He used to drink one bottle once a week, but now there's stress at work. It will increase to three bottles a week. Before you know it, it will increase to three bottles a day. Before you know it, it will start beating you. Before you know it, it will pass the alcoholism to your children. Statistics show that children that pick up these things usually grow up in homes where they do those things. And because you could control your alcoholism, do you know if your child can control it? Because he will pick it up, then he will become the drunkard. He'll become the drug addict. You took your own small, small, you survived, but he will carry it from where you took it. It's relay race. Life is a relay. 
It's legacy. Pastor Middle talked about that yesterday. It's legacy. What legacy are you passing? Today we pray the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because they were passing the baton. What can we say of your own generation? What baton will you pass? Baton of Hennessy. Hennessy bottle. Is what you pass to your son. When the pressures of life come. The other story I heard of somebody that disappeared too. For about 22 years. Left his children. And listen guys. The impact of leaving your children. Either not being there or being a weak parent. The impact is far reaching. You can't measure how bad it affects children. Especially daughters. Fathers. You, you're, you are the covering your daughter has. Women's major need is to be protected and covered. Is somebody get what I'm saying? If you notice in the Bible, they always talk about a woman praying without covering. Women need covering. They need protecting. Your daughters need you as a father. You will give them... I've counseled many girls. Once they don't have father, you find that they, they, are, they are usually confused. They don't know where to go in life. Because you, you are the one that gives them identity. You give them direction. They get the strength to do life because you are present. And when those girls grow without their father, they start looking for a father in every man. So any man that says, I love you, they follow him. Because they don't even know what a real man should look like. Because you left. When the test of life comes, that's when you know the power of marrying a believer. Because for us as Christians, when we face the pressure of life, we go to a rock that is higher than us. Are you getting what I'm saying? We go to God. When we are pressured, we go to God. You heard my wife's story. It took us about eight years to have our first biological child. Eight years. But I told her all those eight years, look, number one, I know you will have children. In fact, before we got married, she told me she would, she find, they've told her she won't have children. And I told her none shall be barren in the land. Forget it. You will have children. We even named the children before we got married. You know, many men, if you tell them that time, I'm going to have children, that's when they will run. They will start ghosting you. I say, you, I will marry you. You know how long I waited for a fine wife, a sensible wife like you. You say you won't have children. You will have children. So we named the children before we got married. It took us eight years to have our first biological child. You see, at those times when the pressure of life come, that's when they'll start calling you to one herbalist. Start calling you to rub something on you. Start calling you to mark it. When the pressures of life come, they will succumb to their real father. Are you here, somebody? To rituals. To, 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 to bring in tortoise from the bush. To bring in different sacrifices. Different satanic things. When the pressures of life come, they'll say, it's your mother from the village. Let's go and approach demons and talk to your mother that has died. Demonic things. When the pressure of life comes. What's the spiritual foundation? Is it born again? The other one, like I was telling you, he traveled abroad to get papers. Uh, for 22 years, they didn't hear from him. 22 years. In the name of paper. When the pressures of life come. You see, for us, me and my wife, we faced that pressure of not having children, but that was a time to turn to God. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Because, listen, the pressures of life will come. There's nothing you want to do about it. It will come. The question, if you marry a bomb boy, he will turn to 419. He will turn to kidnapping. You know all these kidnappers and 419, they have family. There's somebody married to them. I still can't say somebody this year, last month or so. He said the, her boyfriend is a fraudster, he's a 419. But I love him. I say, listen, if he is stealing people's money and they are cursing him, it's only the curse that has no basis that will not stand. If he's making other people miserable, we can't be well with you and your family. Sooner or later, the curse will catch up with you. If people's children are not going to school because your husband stole their money, your own children, they will die in school. Are you getting what I'm saying, sir? You know a known fraudster. You say you love him. You are operating a Ross. A Ross doesn't have sense. I've told you. A Ross has no sense. Just feelings. Passion. Somebody getting what I'm saying, sir? So, spiritual life. That guy walked to look for uh, papers. And you leave your family for forever. All right? So, marry a Christian. Number two, marry your friend. Then last one as I close and take some questions. Marry somebody you like. Do you like this person? Now, in the order of importance, spiritual comes first. In the order of importance, followed by companionship. Are we friends? The last one is eros. It's important, but it's the least important. It's important, however, if you are genuinely this one, eh? 
you genuinely humble and submit to God, and you genuinely seek to become friends, it's easier for this one to adjust. This one is the most adjustable. And if you get what I'm saying. Physical attraction is important, but people place it the other way around. They make it number one. Mm -mm. It's number three. It's the least. Not that it's not important, but it's the least important. Is somebody get what I'm saying? Everywhere in scripture, God talks about physical attraction. He's always contrasting it with internal qualities. You will hear in 1 Peter 3, for instance, he said, let the adorning or your dressing not be the outward dressing of looking good, of putting long hair, of earrings. Let it be the inward adorning of the heart, of a meek and quiet spirit, which is of great price before the Lord. Did somebody get what I'm saying? So they are saying, look, it's good to look good, wear good, have good fashion sense. But he says it's not as important as having good character sense. Internal beauty. Again, you see where the Bible says, though the outward man perishes, he said the inward man is renewed day by day. Everywhere they are contrasting it. You will see um, 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 where King Solomon, I call him Professor Emeritus, Solomon David, where he said, having a beautiful face on an empty head is like putting a gold ring on a pig's nose. What's he saying? He said, marrying a woman that has a beautiful face on an empty head is like wasting your life. Wasting something precious. He's saying, beauty fades. Charm is deceitful. He said, a woman that fears the Lord. So everywhere in scripture, they are not saying beauty is bad. They just say beauty will fade. Are you getting what I'm saying? They didn't say beauty is bad. Though. Beauty is good. My wife is beautiful. Are you getting what I'm saying? I advise you to marry somebody that is beautiful or handsome. Yes. However, please note, beauty fades. He said charm. Charm is how the person makes you feel, how you vibe with the person. The connection you have. The person's charisma. They say charm is deceitful. What do they mean? They mean charm can deceive you into marrying somebody you can't stand their character. He's very funny. <laughs> when, he stops, when he starts sleeping at two nights outside, you know that it's no more fun. Are you getting what I'm saying? I like the way he talks. Or I like the way she talks. She's so interesting. They say charm can deceive you. She's interesting. But does she have character? Does she have respect? Does she have sense? Are you getting what I'm saying? Sir? So spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, make sure the person is born again. So make sure you guys are thinking and talking on the same level. Then body, you must like the person. Were well, you blessed so far this morning? Thank you, guys. All right. Well.